Click the bell icon to get latest videos from Ikeda. Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about the preemptive SJF known as the shortest remaining job first algorithm or SRJF algorithm. Here we will discuss that why we will choose SRJF over SJF and what are the advantages of using SRJF. As we know that SJF has two versions, one is a preemptive and one is a non-preemptive. The non-preemptive one is known as normal SJF and the preemptive one is known as shortest remaining job first algorithm. Here we will see that the current process with executing a CPU burst time can be predetermined and determined with the new process which is coming it and this can be halted the current process and then executing new process. This we can do with, with the SRJF algorithm. Here we will see that we will discuss, here we will compare the remaining job time of a process with the SJF algorithm that we have already calculated. Now, if the remaining job time with the current process and the new process is higher, then the current process started executing its continuation. Now, if the new process is lower has CPU burst time than the previous one, then the new process is allocated and the arrival time is calculated according to that. So here at first we will calculate this average waiting time of a SRGF algorithm and then we will discuss about the advantages and disadvantages. So as we can see that we have four processes which is arriving at 0 millisecond, 1 millisecond, 2 millisecond and 3 millisecond with the burst time of 8, 4, 9 and 5 milliseconds. So we will see that how to calculate the SRJF. So for P1 which is arriving at first because it is arriving at a 0 millisecond of arrival time. So we have to allocate the memory to it without interpreting or comparing the other processes burst time as well. So first we were allocating P1 at 0 millisecond. But as we can see that at 1 millisecond P2 is arriving. Now we have to compare that what is the remaining time of P1 that is 8 minus 1 millisecond it has already executed. So 8 minus 1 7 millisecond is the remaining time of P1 and P2 is of 4 millisecond. So P2 is the shorter one. So we have to allocate P2 at 1 millisecond. So at 1 millisecond, P2 is arriving. Now at the interval of 2 millisecond, P3 is arriving. So what is the remaining job of P2? That is 4 minus 1, that is 3 millisecond. And P3 has a burst time of 9 millisecond. So clearly P2 is against the shorter one. So P2 will continue its execution. Now at 3 millisecond, the P4 is arriving. Now P4 is arriving with a 5 millisecond burst time and P2 is again with the burst time of 2 millisecond as it has again executed 1 millisecond and 1 millisecond, 2 milliseconds of its burst time. So now it has 2 millisecond burst time and P4 is has 5 millisecond burst time. So P4 have 5 millisecond and P2 is again the shorter one with 2 millisecond. So P2 will continue its execution. Now no other process is arriving. So P2 will finish its execution and the other process will be compared after that. So P2 is compared and con continued execution. Mm -hmm. So P2 is compared and continued its execution till 4 millisecond. So at 1 plus 4, 5 millisecond, we have again P1, P3 and P4 as P2 has already completed its execution. So now P1 has 7 millisecond, P3 is 9, min, 9 minus 4 that is 5 millisecond and P4 has 5 millisecond. So clearly among them, P4 is the shorter one. So we will allocate P4. So P4 will continue its execution and complete it by 5 millisecond. 
So P4 has completed its execution on 10 milliseconds. Now P4 has completed, the remaining processes are P1 and P3. So P1 has 7 millisecond and P3 has 9 millisecond. So clearly P1 is the shorter one. So we will allocate the memory to P1 and it has to wait here for 10 milliseconds. So it will complete its execution along 10 plus 7, 17 milliseconds. So as P1 has finished its execution, so P3 is the last one to operate, which will operate for 9 milliseconds as no other processes are compared to execute. So P3 will complete its execution along 26 milliseconds, the all CPU scheduling algorithm is done. So we will calculate the average waiting time of each of the processes and the entire CPU scheduling together. So it is very crucial to calculate the average waiting time here because it has to wait for some more time along the processes which has a shorter waiting time. So we will see how to calculate that. For P1, first it arrives at 0 millisecond and next it arrives at 10 millisecond. So the average waiting time is 10 minus 1 that is 9 millisecond. How this calculation is done? Because P1 is arriving at 10 millisecond here and it has completed all of its 1 millisecond actions previously. So it has to wait merely for 10 minus 1 that is 9 milliseconds. Next is the P2. P2 has arrived at 1 millisecond and it has completed its action in the next 4 milliseconds. So it has to wait for 1 minus 1 that is 0 millisecond. It has arrived and started its execution too. It has not wait to wait. Next we will calculate the arrival of P3. So P3 has to wait here for 17 millisecond and here Already 2 milliseconds, it has already arrived. So we will differentiate between this 17 minus 2 for P3. So it is important to get that why 2 milliseconds are added to it and minus from this 17. Because at 2 millisecond interval of time, P3 has already arrived. So here we are not executing P3, but P3 is... So it is very crucial to important allow this P3 and why we have minus this 2 millisecond from the 17 millisecond. P3 is here allocating at 17 millisecond but it has arrived at 2 millisecond previously. It hasn't start executing because P2 was executing with a shorter amount of burst time. But it has arrived that is why it has to wait for 2 millisecond of shorter time. So here we have minus it from 17 minus 2 that is 15 millisecond and for P4 the waiting time here it is allocating at 5 millisecond and as you can see that arrival time of P4 was 3 millisecond so we have to again subtract it from the its actual allocation time. So the average waiting time for the exact CPU scheduling is 6.5 millisecond. So it is clearly slower and shorter than the SJF preemptive and non-preemptive versions as 7.5 millisecond if we have calculated it. So SJF is clearly better than SJF because it preempts the current executing process and checks and compares if other processes have CPU burst time lesser than the current executing process. See, if the shorter amount of process amount burst time can be allocated to the memory, then it has to wait a shorter amount of time in the CPU scheduling queue, thus making the CPU more efficiently work than the non-preemptive one. This way SRJF can employ and service the CPU scheduling algorithm very much efficiently. Thank you for watching this video. Stay tuned with Ikira and subscribe to Ikira.